Syria will comply with a United Nations resolution to destroy its chemical weapons, and a team of United Nations weapons inspectors is expected to finish its probe in Syria by tomorrow. Well, today that U.N. convoy was seen coming back to a hotel in Damascus earlier today. The destination they came back from is unknown. The U.N. says teams are looking into seven alleged chemical weapons attack, and that's four more than were originally reported. Joining us now with more analysis is security expert Alex Holstein. Alex is here in our Toronto studios. Now, Alex, the first thing I want to talk about is the fact that they're talking about seven chemical weapons mm -hmm. usage. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that there's been more than was reported originally mm -hmm. um, indicates a level of subterfuge that maybe or perhaps the Syrian government, the Assad regime, is engaging in. Why should we take them at their word at this point? <laughs> we shouldn't. And uh, as far as this whole uh, situation is concerned, including the diplomacy behind it, I mean, this is, this is the Andrew Lloyd Webber of uh, musicals, of, of Broadway shows, of, of theatrical diplomacy. I mean, it's all, it's all window dressing mainly. Mm. I mean, this is stagecraft, not statecraft that we're seeing go down because there's nothing of substance to this uh, UN resolution. Uh, we discussed last time the possibility of uh, Chapter 7 of the UN Charter being uh, mentioned in the resolution, language to that effect, which would uh, present the possibility of uh, armed force being used. It gives the option, Chapter 7, that the UN, uh, under Security Council resolution, can uh, do, uh, uh, can use uh, armed forces to en enforce its will. But uh, it doesn't require it, and also it's not mentioned in this resolution. It just mentions vague consequences. Well, we've seen that before in 1441 from Iraq with the Iraq War situation, with 1441 calling for consequences. We know what kind of diplomatic debate that caused between Russia, France, and the United States in the wake of 1441, when the United States went back to get a resolution that would specify those consequences when Colin Powell made his presentation regarding weapons of mass destruction. We saw what kind of debate that led to, and we saw what kind of uh, sort of international breakdown we had in relations between old allies and uh, old adversaries. So it's a real problem. Alex, some people may call us uh, skeptics or, or being less than optimistic about the outcome <laughs> of the situation. I can't imagine why, but yeah. I mean, here it is. Especially a guy like me. Yeah, you've got a regime <laughs> that has basically been wiping out its people for two and a half years now. Yeah. They've been supported by Iran. They've been supported by mm -hmm. Russia. And now Russia is the author of a diplomatic solution to the situation. Mm -hmm. Yet this civil war, which was supposed to enter into a ceasefire phase last week, is still going on. Sure. Where's the believability in any of this? It's none. It's it's a complete. It's it, it's a it's a masquerade. It's it's a, it's all it's all smoke and mirrors, mm. it, and and we're stuck in the middle of it. But the problem is, is I mean, I think it's a good thing that it's gone back to the UN only because it prevents the United States from taking action later on. Really, unless the United States really the wants armada to, is still in place though. It certainly is, and if it, but if if President Obama takes unilateral action again after we saw what happened with Iraq. Um, even if it's small scale, after, and after putting it back in the UN's court and making it the purview of the UN, uh, he's going to have real diplomatic fallout from that around the world. And it, the, the, the problem is, Brian, though, that he didn't do that to begin with, and the U.S. has, has really lost a lot of prestige and power as a result of the cal calamitous uh, handling of this, this situation from August till now. And uh, Russia has regained its superpower status. In fact, I would say it's a something different. It's a hyperpower. It's something new that we haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. I, I'm still not going to agree with you on that because <laughs> I think that there's a, a bit of gamesmanship you did going the end on last there. Time. You almost well, agreed you know, with let, let's just say this. I, I will you willingly may, accede may that your right. point has some validity, <laughs> but I'm, I don't know if I can agree with it just yet. I think there's sure. a lot more to come in this situation mm -hmm. than we see playing here, and I think a lot more to come includes the situation with Iran. All of a sudden, yes. the rhetoric out of Iran is changing mm -hmm. with the change in the presidency mm -hmm. there. Rouhani's in power. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't say he's in power. Right. He's the president. We know who's in yeah, power there, the right. Ayatollah Khomeini. How can the rhetoric have changed so much considering the fact that the man who really is pulling the strings is still the Ayatollah Khomeini? Well, uh, the Ayatollah uh, is, it runs the show, but, uh, and, and there's other vested interests in Iran as well, mainly the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. And what we see, interestingly, uh, lately in Iran is, you know, this is a major security apparatus that, that has 
it wields incredible power, and they have that power. A lot of it comes from the nuclear program. They have because they've done all the you know uh, secret accounts and offshore this and and nine dummy corporations to to get the equipment to do what they're doing. Um, they've made billions of dollars. It's a billion dollar enterprise for the Revolutionary Guard. It's given them a lot of power in in Iran enough that the supreme leader himself, the Ayatollah Khamenei, has uh, kept uh, his own intelligence organization called Office 101 mm -hmm. in order to keep an eye on it, all the players in the political apparatus of Iran. And what I've heard he's done recently is he actually has fused Office 101 into the Iranian Revolutionary Guards intelligence apparatus along with other uh, intelligence uh, organizations from the Ministry of Security, which is a rival of the Revolutionary Guard, which says to me that he's doing what so call, I call a soft purge, uh, making sure his people are in the right places in the Revolutionary Guard so that they don't become too powerful. So this is just to go to all those uh, different players that are involved in the Iranian and institutions that are involved in Iran, the most powerful ones, and that the Supreme Leader does have to be careful about balancing them. And uh, th this whole thing with, you know, that they're, it's a great stride and a great shift, I, I, don't, I, I see it as, as a development mm -hmm. and an interesting development. Uh, and unique and new and an evolution, but nothing that has, you know, we're going to see a radical shift from Iran necessarily in regard to its nuclear program. So yeah. the outcome could be quite, you know, status quo. I still have to come back to that same phrase I used about Syria, believability. You know, I'd like to touch on the developing situation in Lebanon, mm. but we don't have enough time. Yeah, well, so we're going to have to get you back next Thank goodness, because that's a whole other uh, It is, but that situation, <laughs> and while Syria is bo boiling over, yeah. Lebanon's not far behind. Definitely, it has Balaz there, and that's Iran's Absolute, proxy. Exactly. So we'll get to that part to next week, huh, yeah. maybe? All right, I hope so. <laughs> Thanks sure. for this, Alex. No problem. That's security expert Alex Holstein joining us live here in our Toronto studio.